Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Okay, um, so today I'm going to talk to you about my research into medieval Scottish window glass, and mainly from ecclesiastical and monastic sites. I'm carrying out research at Heriot Watch University um, in the Department of the Sustainable Built Environment, and I'm studying window glass use and production um, throughout the medieval, post medieval period, right through to the industrial periods um, in Scotland. In particular, I'm looking at the scientific analysis of medieval and post-medieval window glass from a range of archaeological sites. Um, the later glass, the post-medieval glass, a lot of this is domestic rather than ecclesiastical or monastic. A colleague has also been looking at the analysis of post-medieval and later window glass, um, which is still in situ in buildings um, in Scotland um, using portable um, X-ray fluorescence analysis techniques. And um, in general, our group of researchers are also looking at the history and the conservation ethics of window glass um, and the preservation of the window glass that may still be in situ uh, within buildings in Scotland and how the planning process affects the conservation of the window glass. But today, um, I'm talking about Scottish medieval window glass. So in Scotland, there is no evidence that glass was made from raw materials until the turn of the 17th century um, AD. Um, there's possible evidence for um, glass manufacture slightly earlier than that, over the end of the um, 16th century, um, but there's no um, clear archaeological or documentary evidence. So while we obviously had glass in Scotland um, long before this, um, there is evidence of glass working. So like as far back as the Iron Age, there's evidence of Iron Age beads, glass beads being made in Scotland, but the glass itself came from the Mediterranean, Egypt, Levantine regions and was imported into Scotland. But obviously we had quite a lot of glass um, from early times as well. Um, the earliest window glass is we get from um, Roman forts. So window glass has been found at um, Inveresque and Falkirk, for instance. And the earliest um, medieval window glass is from uh, Whithorn, so the monastery at Whithorn. But in Scotland, we have um, no high medieval window glass, which is still in situ in buildings. Um, so if you think of all the great cathedrals, minsters in England and in Europe, Northern Europe, um, quite a lot of these still have medieval window glass that you can go and see today that is still in the windows. It was installed in in the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. A lot of it's been heavily restored, repaired, might have been changed around quite a bit, but there's still a substantial amount of original glass in windows. However, this is not the case in Scotland. Um, pretty much all the window glass was destroyed around the time of the Reformation in Scotland. Um, the reformists did a very good job um, of destruction. Um, and most of the glass that we find that I work on um, has been excavated from um, post-Reformation and destruction contexts from various sites um, in Scotland. Uh, this panel here, um, is one of two of the earliest um, glass panels that still survive in buildings in Scotland um, from around 1540, um, which one of them's a, a coat of arms of Mary of Guise, and this is in the Magdalen Chapel um, in the Cowgate in Edinburgh. Um, but this is the earliest glass that is still in situ where it was originally installed in a building um, in Scotland. Um, we have recently, um, I suppose, rediscovered a panel of mixed medieval glass um, that was made from pieces of glass that was found at Holyrood Abbey in the early 1900s. And this was reconstructed into a panel by the glass artist Douglas Strachan. Um, and we've relocated this in stores in Windsor Castle. Um, so hopefully um, in the next um, few months or so, I'll be able to do some more research on this. Um, but this is quite an interesting rediscovery. So the glass that I'm looking at um, is window glass fragments, like I said, found from mainly cathedrals and monasteries. Um, the glass is likely to have been made sometime between the 12th and the 16th centuries, but we're finding it in the uh, uh, Reformation destruction contexts. So what I want to try and find out is a bit more about where this glass came from originally. Um, there is very little documentary evidence from this period. Um, importation um, documents and records from many of the major ports might talk about a lot of other things, but actually glass, particularly flat glass, so windows, um, is quite noticeable by, noticeable by its absence. Um, so it's always presumed that this glass has come either from the European continent or via England, um, but there is very, very little evidence for this. 
what I want to find out is if there are any changes to the, to the supply of glass. Um, so in different regions, did the glass come from different areas of Europe? Um, did different types of buildings? Um, did monasteries have different types of glass, possibly from cathedrals? Did this change over the medieval period over, the t over time? Did the glass come from different regions? So I'm very much comparing the data that I'm gathering, the chemical data, um, about this glass um, with chemical data that's all already been gathered um, from various sites in England and Europe um, to discover similarities and differences. And I'm quite lucky that while no work like this has really been done before in Scotland, um, a lot of work has been done um, in quite a few sites in England and in Europe, um, both from windows that are still in buildings that are quite well dated because they know exactly when these windows are built into the buildings, um, but also from glass manufacturing sites as well. So we have the glass waste that we can also analyse to determine the chemical composition of glass that was made in different manu manufacturing sites. Um, so um, this is some of the glass I've been looking at. Uh, the glass, oops, sorry, go back. Uh, the glass over there um, is glass from Elgin Cathedral, um, and it's quite typical of sort of 13th century um, grisé glass. The majority of glass that is found is plain or white glass, so it's clear. Um, it, most of it doesn't have so much decoration on it, and only 10% of the glass um, that has been found is actually coloured glass, so blues, reds, yellows, pinks. Um, the decoration is what we call foliate decoration, so it's a mixture of sort of leaves and trefoils, sort of vines. Um, there's also geometric um, patterns, shapes, so circles. Um, and the idea is that over time, so in the sort of early 12th, 13th centuries, um, this was quite um, stiff um, patterns, and gradually over time, by the 14th, mid 14th century, the patterns are much more naturalistic, so oak leaves, which look more realistic and natural. Um, as we don't have any um, glass in Scotland, uh, this is a window from Poitiers Cathedral, um, which gives some indication of what the windows might have looked like in the great buildings in Scotland, like Elgin Cathedral, St Andrew's Cathedral. So it's mainly a clear glass with accents of colour um, and painted decoration. But of course, this is our current knowledge, what we get in the archaeological record, and it may be um, that they might have looked more colourful than this or more different than this. Uh, one thing of note is that we really don't find um, any, we haven't found any figurative um, pieces, so nothing with faces or eyes or hands. Um, we haven't found pieces with architectural motifs, sort of crocketing or drapery or altars. Um, it is very much um, this um, foliate and geometric patterns that we're finding in Scotland. So this is more glass from St Andrews, which I've been working on, um, and you can see uh, these are border pieces that are likely to have gone round um, the edges of panels. Uh, this panel here is from Lincoln Cathedral, but it's been heavily restored. You can see that bit up there. These bits are very similar to what we've been finding at St Andrews. Um, these bits have been moved around, so they wouldn't have originally been in that position in the window glass. Um, but hopefully you can also see um, some of the foliate designs um, and cross-hatching at the back of some of the pieces as well, which is also quite typical um, of what we're finding in Scotland. So um, it may be that some of the glass we were finding originally looked like this. Um, so before I talk about my results, I will just briefly summarise how glass is made. Um, so glass, as most people know, is made mainly from sand. Um, but in order for the silicon dioxide in the sand to melt, um, it needs uh, addition of an alkali or a flux to lower the melting temperature. And, oops, sorry. and this is usually from uh, wood ash or a plant ash, um, which is usually prepared, washed, ground. And this flux changes um, geographically and over time. So... Um, when you go back to the um, Roman Iron Age, it was very much a, a, a mineral was used rather than a plant ash, a sodium mineral. Whereas by the time you get to the medieval period, it's pretty much all wood ash being used. Um, you'd often add um, collets, recycled glass, to improve the melting. It had been melted to a fritz and then reheated at a much higher temperature to produce the actual molten glass. And then at this stage, they would add colour in things like copper alloys, cobalt, lead. And for the glass to be blown into windows in the medieval period, it was done in one of two ways. Uh, the first way is the crown method, where a blob of glass is taken on the end of the pontal, the long stick, and it's blown, and it's spun around very, very fast. So you end up creating this large circle of glass like this. Or the other method was the cylinder method, um, whereby a large cylinder of glass was blown, like here, the two ends are cut off, and then it's cut along its length, 
and then laid out on a table to form a, a sheet of glass. And there are, um, when you look at the glass closely, some, some of the pieces of glass, you can tell which of these two methods um, it is made by, um, depending on the bubbles. So bubbles in here would be going round in a circle like that, whereas the bubbles in the glass here would be going in nice straight lines. And you can also look at the edges or the ripples of the glass as well, um, which can give you some idea of how the glass was actually made. So the elements in the glass that I'm looking at when I'm carrying out chemical analysis, obviously silica, aluminium, titanium, which relate to the sand, iron, um, magnesium, calcium are all present in sand as well. Um, but the magnesium, calcium um, may also come from the flux, from the alkali. Uh, sodium um, was the predominant flux used um, certainly before the medieval period, um, used less in the medieval period, um, but then again um, used in more modern glass, soda glasses um, in the um, 19th century. Uh, potassium um, is the main flux, uh, the main um, element in the flux from wood ash that we are mainly looking at in the medieval period. Also, we have things like phosphates, which could be indicative of the type of flux. So um, phosphorus is associated um, with um, being um, quite rich in things like ferns and brackens. So instead of using tree wood, um, if you're finding high levels of phosphate, it may be that um, ferns and brackens have been used. And then you come on to sort of the more trace elements. So we're looking at things like manganese for decolorants, all the transition metal elements, um, which can be added as a coloration. Um, and then further trace elements that are found both in the sand and the flux. And finally, um, what are called rare earth elements, which are sort of at the bottom of the periodic table, um, which are predominantly indicative of the sand source. <coughs> so what can chemical analysis tell us? Well, it can tell us um, the changes in composition and it can show us the development of the recipes over time, the development of the glass making technology, maybe how materials were prepared before they were melted to produce the glass. So you can see the different materials that are being used. Um, and in some cases, it's possible to actually um, locate the area of manufacture, although this is obviously a lot more difficult. So like I said, I'm comparing the chemical composition of um, the glass we're finding in Scotland um, with glass that's been already been studied by people in England and Europe, and I'm looking at the regional chronological compositions in these different areas and how the Scottish glass compositions compare. So for the major and minor elements, so the ones that, ones that are quite a lot of, they mainly show us uh, sort of the recipes that could be regional or chronological. But then um, what's quite different about this is that I'm also looking for trace and rare earth elements um, which can help to provenance location. Um, so far at this stage, I haven't looked at isotopes, but they've been used quite a lot as well to help provenance loca location, um, mainly for the sort of Roman Iron Age glasses, um, but also for some English glasses quite recently, looking at um, um, provenancing where in England certain glasses were been made by the um, isotopes of neodymium, neodymium strontium, um, and lead. So where might glass have come from to Scotland if it wasn't being made here? Um, this is a, a very simplified summary of the main areas um, where um, glass um, manufacturing areas have been identified in the 12th to 16th centuries. So we mainly have areas in France, oh, sorry, wrong one again, areas in France, so which is classed as Normandy, the more central eastern parts of France, sort of Lorraine, um, German and Rhineish Rhineland areas, um, and then we have um, glass manufacturing that we know of in England, certainly in the Weald by the 13th century, and in Staffordshire, sort of glass was being made for York Minster, certainly by 1400 from the Staffordshire region in England. Um, I've put another two areas, but it's less likely that the glass um, from Scotland is coming from these areas. Of course, there could be many other places that we don't actually know about because there isn't the documentary or archaeological evidence. But these are the main areas that have been studied. And just a few of the research that has been done where actual analysis of either glass in windows or glass in manufacturing regions has already been carried out that I'm comparing my work to. So where would the glass, how would the glass get to Scotland? Well, the most obvious route would be from places like Bruges and so Antwerp in the Low Countries. We know Scotland in the medieval period's main trading routes were down the east coast, particularly with Bruges. Um, so it's likely that the glass may have come from these different regions and come up the east coast. Glass may have come from England. Um, 
It's unlikely to have come overland because it's quite tricky to transport glass, particularly at those times, but it may have gone out to the coast um, and, and then um, come up the coastal route. So the question is to try and find out where this Scottish glass came from, where the glass found in Scotland came from. So I've analysed, used a number of techniques. So the first main one I've used is scanning electron microscopy. And I've had to take um, samples of glass so, um, to, make little, ooh, to make little mounted cross sections, um, as you see here. So this is a piece of red glass, so you can see corrosion on both sides, a white glass, and then an area of red glass over the top of the white glass. Um, this is a microscope image, and you can see how heavily corroded the glass is. So both these sides here are um, corrosion, and I'm analysing this area in the centre that I've called the hard glass, which is, where, which is most like the original composition of the glass. Um, we've also used portable X-ray fluorescence um, to look at the heavier elements, things like strontium, rubidium, and the transition metals. But the problem with this is that it needs a corrosion-free surface and is much more suitable for the work I'm doing on post-medieval window glass um, rather than the medieval glass because that's so heavily corroded. So I only really looked at about 30 samples of glass from Elgin um, from using portable XRF. Um, but then I was lucky enough to receive funding um, from both the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland and also Historic Environment Scotland to carry out um, laser ablated inductively coupled plasma mass spectroscopy, which is a bit of a mouthful. For this, I um, went down to the Natural History Museum, and this technique is capable of analysing trace and rare earth elements down to part per million, and in some cases, part per billion, um, and is a very precise and accurate technique. But of course, it's quite expensive, so um, I was able to analyse about 50 um, medieval samples um, using this technique um, from about eight sites. So the sites I studied, um, I've collated a list of about 25 different sites in Scotland where medieval window glass has been found. Um, and I've obviously not had time to work on all of them. So I've worked on these 13 at the moment. Um, the sites I've worked on mainly are where there's been large assemblages found, so Elgin Cathedral and St Andrew's Cathedral. Um, and then I've visited Perth and worked through their um, collections of medieval window glass, which includes two sites in Perth, um, Lindors and also Elko, um, and then other um, collections in the National Museum of Scotland as well. So the results. My results I'm going to talk about are quite simplified to what I've actually been finding, and I've also been comparing a lot more elements than what I'm going to show you today, but it can get quite complicated, so um, I will give you a, a reasonable summary. Um, so again, I'm drawing very much on the work of others, um, particularly Robert Brill, who worked at the Corning Glass Museum for many years and um, did most analysis of um, glass, window glass, um, from the medieval period. So at Elgin, um, like many places, I'm finding three different compositions of glass. The first one, um, it seems to be most predominant, and it has a calcium-potassium ratio of between about one and two. And Brill um, suggests this comes from France. The second I'm finding is one which has a much lower calcium-potassium ratio of less than one, but it has increased amounts of magnesium and phosphorus. And this is suggested to be from the addition of fern ashes, which is a particular tradition of glassmaking in the Normandy region. And Brill suggests, therefore, that this comes from northern, northern, western France, Normandy. And the third um, grouping is one with a, an increased calcium, so more calcium in the mix. Um, and Brill suggests this is, comes more from the Rhineland, Germany areas of Europe. You will note as well the clustering of colours. So there's this light blue glass here, dark blue glass. The brown just appears to be this um, Normandy tradition of glass. And the green all seems to be a very similar composition as well. So just to look at all the sites, I'll go through these quickly. Um, we have our three areas, um, which I've already identified, which are based on, on Brill's identification. So from St Andrews, um, we have most of it seems to be coming from northwest Normandy region of France. Um, two pieces, possibly Rhineland, Rhinish glass. Elgin, we've talked about. Dunfermline, the central eastern France region. As is Lindors, mainly with one um, piece in the possibly from northwest France. Iona, both pieces are of the very high phosphorus com composition, so we would suggest Normandy. But then Elko is very different. Um, 
this is a very high lime glass. It's, a, it's what's termed a high lime, low alkali composition. And in England, we would assume this composition would be no earlier than the middle of the 16th century. However, we know this glass is much earlier than that. Um, it's certainly at the latest, I think, um, at the end of the 15th century. Um, so this is quite interesting. Five minutes, okay. Um, at Perth Whitefriars, again, we're back to more of the French composition, but the Blackfriars um, monastic site in Perth, again, we've got this very high lime, low alkali um, composition as well. We're finding at Elko. And Glenluce is interesting because we've got both the French compositions down at the bottom, but then we've also got three of the high lime, low alkali composition, and these three, which are a bit of a really high lime, low alkali composition, which I think are actually probably later um, 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 contamination, though, you know, late, later pieces have been found in earlier de deposits. So I then come on to look at the rare earth elements. So that was looking at all the data from the major and minor elements. This is the rare earth elements. And I've been finding, similar to other researchers in Europe, three patterns. So I won't go into how these are created, but it's to do with the comparison of the, each of the rare earth elements with the amount which is in the, in the earth's crust, and you create these spidergrams. Um, so I'm finding three patterns, the more smoother pattern, pattern here, and then one that is very, I suppose, jagged. <laughs> this here is what's called the Europium dip, um, which a number of authors have, have attributed to certain sites, particularly in Germany. Um, so it's quite um, an interesting profile, that one. So when we compare these profiles, these rare earth profiles, um, which is looking at the sand, so where the sand came from, um, we can compare with the major element compositions, and we find that, so what I've called group two, so the orange group, they all seem to be a high potassium glass. The group three, which is the blue group, all appears to be the high lime, low alkali glass. But then group one is quite interesting that it covers the full range of compositions. So what I'm interpreting from this, in this region, so the group one region, glass was probably made out of the high potassium um, um, type recipe first. But over a period of time, the glass recipes changed in that region. So they were still using the same sand, the same resources. But the recipes, the amount of ingredients they were using changed. And in that same region, they ended up making high lime, low alkali glass. So from that and from the work of others, as I've already talked about, these are my suggestions where these three different types of glass would come from. So the blue would be from Rhineland, Germany, the high lime, high lime low alkali glass, um, the orange, northwest Normandy, and the um, grey um, trace would be from central and eastern France. But one thing this does tell us that the previous work lots of people done just look, have done looking just at the major elements, you also need to look at the rare earth elements as well, because if you got, say, one of these grey ones, you could assume it was from northwest France or from central eastern France. So you need to look at lots of elements combined as well. And this is um, a summary table um, of um, where I think um, the different types of glass that have so far I have found in Scotland have been coming from. So I think we have glass coming from central eastern France, Normandy, um, and Rhineland. And then I want to look at the change over time. So the glass I've been finding has all been found in post-Reformation, so sort of 16th century context. But when was the glass actually made when it was put, when it was put into the buildings? So Glenluce is an interesting site because uh, we have one group of glass, which is a high potassium glass, that was found associated with the main sort of church areas of the Abbey at Glenluce. And then we have another type of glass that when it's been analysed um, is high lime, low alkali glass, but this was found associated with the chapter house, and we know the chapter house wasn't built until the late 15th century. Um, and the rare earth element profiles are also um, different as well. So from this, my suggestion is that the earlier the glass came from, so the 13th century glass was coming in from northern France, Normandy. Um, there's others, um, this, there's, um, when, when we look at the phosphorus and other elements as well, this is very much the Normandy composition. Um, but then by the um, late um, 15th century, the glass was being imported from Rhineland, so the glass was coming in from a different area. We also see the addition of salts and also chlorine, um, which seems to be a Rhinish um, recipe as well. They were adding salt to the mix, probably to improve the melt. 
And finally, um, a comparison with some work that's been done at York Minster. This is looking at um, the trace elements, so lanthium and iterbium, um, and then titanium and, and niobium. And these are um, areas where work on different windows at York have found where their, um, well, where their glass is falling into. So we have a mixture here of mixed dates, but this, all the um, points that would fall into here were from a 12th century window at York. The points that would fall into there were from a, a window dated very tightly, 1290 to 1300. And this area here is quite interesting because this is glass, um, English white glass made in the Staffordshire region. But when we um, impose, superimpose the Scottish, so my results, onto this, um, we see the majority of the glass is found in this area of mixed dates, which doesn't really tell us that much. But interestingly, we have this group here um, that fall very tightly within this um, 1290 to 1300 date from this window in York. All of these samples, when I go back to look at them, are actually from St Andrew's Cathedral. So from this evidence, it looks like the, the glass um, made on the continent was being um, exported um, at a similar time to both York and to St Andrews, and it would be interesting to explore that further. This looks interesting. However, when I checked out what these two samples were, both of these were green glass, um, and I'm finding that the green glass, the additional lead, um, which um, is in part of the copper alloy colorant in the green glass, I think that's leading to increased um, lanthanum levels. So because this is bright green glass, it's clearly not English white glass from Staffordshire. So one thing I could say is that so far, none of the glass I've analyzed from Scotland bears any resemblance um, to English glass from Staffordshire. So in conclusion, um, the glass, the white clear glass um, that we've been found finding um, in Scottish sites has been imported from a range of European manufacturing sites, uh, northwest France, central eastern France, and also Rhineland and Germany from the 13th century. So we know at Elgin, for instance, that glass from all three of these areas we think was coming in at a very similar time because the decoration on, on the different pieces of glass was all um, indicative of this 13th century date. But the, most of the glass I'm finding from the 13th century does seem to be coming from northwestern France and central eastern France. Coloured glass was probably made in specialist centres. Um, so the red, green, dark blue, brown colours were most likely made in areas of French origin. But this particular, particular light blue glass I found at Elgin, I found at Caldingham and St Andrews. Um, and it is very much of a distinct composition that I think was being made in the in Rhineland, Germany, um, regions at the time. But by the 15th century, it appears that instead of coming mainly from France, mainly from northern France and then central France, it was now coming from the Rhineland region. Um, and there's quite a lot of um, work done in Belgium on this sort of Rhinish, Rhenish type of glass. Um, there was high lime, low alkali glass um, made by the cylinder method. Um, and it's known to be cheaper than glass that was made in Normandy, um, which was still being made by the crown glass method. And a particular interest is that this high lime, low alkali glass is rare in England before the mid-16th century, as the English glass um, being made in the Weald in Staffordshire was very much of the potassium-rich uh, composition. So, so far, we have no evidence of English manufactured glass um, being used in Scotland. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I had better just um, thank everybody who's given me assistance um, during my project. Um, particularly the Society of Antiquaries and Historic Environment Scotland for funding um, the LAIC PMS analysis um, and everybody else at HES and all the museums where I um, was able to get access to collections. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was